Good morning, everyone. At the outset, I'd like to thank the Department of Periodontics, Assisi Dental College, and especially my mentor, teacher, and guide, Dr. K. Nandakumar sir, for inviting me for an yet again rapid review, that is season six of rapid review. And uh, this time we have to conduct this on an online platform. Not taking much of my time, the topic that is allotted to me is management of peri-implantitis. Now, we now have around 35 to 45 years of documented implant practice. And we have a number of implant companies. We have around 1,500 different implant companies. And now everybody wants to place an implant, respective of what specialty is. Even a general dentist wants to, wants to place an implant. The problem here is when so many people are placing implants without basic knowledge, sound basic knowledge about implant science, problems or complications seem to occur. And you should know what are the short-term as well as long-term complications. Now, when we look into the implant failures, we find, now this one's this study that uh, came up in 2014 by Han, and this gives us a data that approximately 47 percentage of implant failures occurred due to inflammation induced bone loss. Now, 47 percentage of the total implant that you are going to place. Now, that is a big, big figure. So, as a periodontist, here is your opportunity. Now, a lot of cases, everybody, every other specialist will be doing cases, but you will have to manage the, the disease or the lesion that is induced due to inflammation in relation to an implant. And that is what exactly what we are going to discuss today. Now, first we'll look at what is the difference between an implant and a natural tooth. Now, when you look at a natural tooth, you now you have now you have a epithelium like this. And underneath this epithelium, you can see this gingival fibers. And look at the orientation of these fibers. You can see a number of group of fibers coming and attaching to the cementum of the alveolar, cementum of the tooth. Now, what this gives is a cushion that whenever there's an inflammation over here, this band of tissues over here will retard or slow down the spread of inflammation from here to the surrounding mold. But the difference here in relation to an implant here is you have a long peri-implant sulcus. And when you look at the orientation of the fibers, these fibers are not oriented perpendicular or attached to this implant surface, but they are arranged parallel to the long axis of this implant. So what happens is whenever there is an inflammation that occurs here, it immediately, there is because of this loose connective tissue over here, it goes and attaches to the underlying bone or it spreads very rapidly to the underlying bone. So that is a basic stru structure that you have to understand before we venture more about peri-implant diseases. Now, over the years, when we look at different classifications, you may find, you may not find anything about implant or implant diseases in those classifications. Now, the latest classification of 2018 have classified peri-implant diseases and conditions as health, peri-implant health, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, and peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Now, peri-implant, clinically peri-implant health is characterized by, there's no, absolutely, there is no inflammation and there is no bleeding and probing. Similar to periodontite or periodontal health, now here also, there may be some bone loss, but at the same time, you can maintain peri-implant health. And uh, when you look at uh, periodontitis, or when you look at a normal uh, sulcus of gingiva around a sulcus around the natural tooth, you may find the sulcus depth is two to three millimeter. But here, in relation to an implant, you can't actually define a particular sulcus depth. Now we'll discuss that in later in a later stage. So there is no particular uh, minimum probing depth in relation to a peri-implant health. That is something that you should understand. Now, whenever this inf there is inflammation in relation to the peri-implant mucosa, I can 
to the inflammation around the tooth that is which results in gingivitis you have synonymous with gingivitis in a natural that you have perineal plant mucositis now this lesion is caused just by the same plaque that causes gingivitis okay and uh, like gingivitis you remove the etiology ask the patient to maintain good oral hygiene the condition reverses back here also perineal plant mucositis the condition can be reversed if the etiology is removed and the patient maintains good oral hygiene now when the inflammation extends from the mucosa to the underlying bone it is no more known as perineal plant mucositis it is known as perineal plantitis so that is what we are going to discuss today now even the new classification when you look the new classification also do not give give sub classify or what extent the perineal plant lesion whether it's an early or a moderate or an advanced lesion so again we have to go back to an old classification by 2000 in 2012 by stewart and paul and which gives us early moderate and advanced in the early stages you have a pocket depth of four, up to 4 mm and uh, along with bleeding or and or suppuration and you have around 25% of implant length that is exposed or bone loss has occurred in relation to 25% of the total length of the implant suppose you have an implant length of 10 10 mm now about 25 2.5 mm of that implant has lost bone in the early stage now when it is moderate the probing depth increases to about 6 mm along with the same all features and the bone loss has gone from 25 to 50 percentage and in advance you have a probing depth of more than 8 mm with more than 50 percentage of the implant that is lost by means of bone bone that is lost in relation to the implant so that is how you classify sub classify a periodontitis lesion now with regard to the status of implant and the supporting tissues now there are three terminologies now in commonly they, these terminologies are asked for essay as well as commonly in your viva also so that is what why we are going to discuss that three terminologies are what is an ailing implant what is a failing implant and what is a failed implant an ailing implant is nothing but an implant that displays progressive bone loss and pocketing but there is no clinical mobility but what is a failing implant a failing implant is similar to that an ailing implant but the problem is this implant is refractory refractory to any form of treatment that you give in spite of any treatment that you give the condition worsens and over a period of time you lose that implant so that is a failing implant but what is a failed implant a failed implant is a implant that is either fractured or whenever you see a periapical radiolus a circumscribed radiolus and see all around the implant it is failed there is mobility around the implant it is failed it is amenable to any sort of treatment that you give it does not respond you can consider that as a failed implant so these are three different terms that you should understand <clears throat> now we'll go into the peri peri implantitis in detail as such now first we look at the incidence and prevalence there's a lot of studies uh, which has come out showing the incidence and uh, i just want to particularly focus upon three studies at different points of time the first is a study 2008 which shows that in perimplantitis you have about 50% of the implant sites and 28% of the implant sites are affected by means of perimplantitis 50% by means of mucositis the second study was in uh, 2013 that is a large study about 1500 patients were examined around 6000 more than 6000 implants were followed up and they found that there was a prevalence of 63 around 63 percentage of perimplant mucositis and 19 percentage perimplantitis now the ervedi recent study 2019 where they have followed up these implants for a, around 300 implants for about 19 years and the result they have got is there is a perimplant mucositis of 40 percentage perimplant that is of 15 percentage so from this data it is absolutely clear that there is a large percentage around 50 to 65 percentage of people that are affected by mucositis and around 50 to 30 percentage of all implants that you place are affected by means of perimplantitis 
Now, let's look at the etiopathogenesis. Now, when you look at the etiopathogenesis of peri-implantitis, you can say that it is almost, almost exactly to the etiopathogenesis associated with a periodontal pocket <coughs> or periodontitis. Now, is peri-implant mucosite is different from gingivitis? No, it has got almost the same etiology, only thing the spread of inflammation or the conversion from mucositis to peri-implantitis, it's at a faster rate. Now, is peri-implantitis and periodontitis the same? Now, there are certain subtle differences between them. One is the extent of the lesion. When you look at the extent of the lesion, in cases of peri-implantitis lesion, always the apical extent of this lesion is very large. It's more apical. That is one difference. So when you look at the composition of cells, you can see that the, the periodontitis as well as peri-implantitis has got almost the same composition of predominantly of lymphocytes and plasma cells. But when you look at the number of neutrophils and macrophages, it is more in case of <coughs> peri-implantitis. Now, the rate of progression, as I've already told before, is much more in peri-implantitis compared to periodontitis. But when you look at periodontal lesion, just about the, the most apical aspect of the lesion, you always have a self-limiting or a protective capsule. But when you look at peri-implantitis, this protective lesion is not there. And you can see that the, the infection is almost to the extent of the bone, where you can see the bone is lined by means of a lot of osteoclasts. So these are the basic difference between peri-implantitis and peri-implantitis, and both of them almost share the same microbiology and the same etiopathogenesis. Now, how will you diagnose the case of peri-implantitis? Now, there are different parameters by which you can diagnose, and that is exactly what we are going to discuss one by one. One is appearance. Most of the time, an early peri-implant lesion is, is, is being discovered by means of chance maybe as a result of slight change in color, as you see here, there is slight change in color, then slight enlargement may be there, associated with bleeding and probing. And in the later stages, what you find is, you know, that as the tissue recedes, some of the threads may be exposed, and also some of the label bone may be resorbed, and as such, uh, this, the underlying implant may be seen through. You may see a bluish hue in relation to this, uh, in relation to where you have placed an implant. So that is where, how you can diagnose mainly by means of appearance. So one is redness and the second is bleeding. Maybe. <clears throat> then second is probing. Now, it, I know for diagnosis and monitoring peri-implant disease, this is a very good method. Now, in previously, probing uh, was supposed to cause damage to the peri-implant tissue, but that is not the case now. You can probe, but you can probe with the same, almost the same force by which you can probe peri tissues. That is, you use a force of 0.25 newton centimeter. And <clears throat> the probing technique is the same. You should probe parallel to the long axis of the implant, not parallel to the prosthesis here. Now, in most of the cases here, what happens is, you know, you place an implant, you place a bulky process. So it will be very difficult to probe. So in cases where it's, you have much difficulty in probing, you can use a plastic probe. Otherwise, the best probe is always a steel probe. And uh, one more thing is because in, in, as a result of peri-implanted, sometimes, you know, thread may be exposed. And uh, when you probe, the probe may come and go and hit one thread and it may not go be up to the most apical aspect of the pocket. So you should be careful, careful so that this doesn't happen when you probe. Now there's a correct method of probing and this incorrect method, you know, now this, you're probing around the prosthesis, not around, uh, along the long axis of the implant that is placed. Now, I, I told you before that there is no definite probing depth in relation to an implant, because some of the implants are maybe placed uh, a little bit subcrestly. So in the initial stage itself, you may have a peri-implant pocket depth of around five millimeter. And uh, at the same time, with this five millimeter, the implant is stable, there is absolutely, it is healthy. So what you have to do is, after you place a restoration, you place and you take a probing depth. 
but in relation to a natural tooth, you have the cemento enamel junction, which acts as a reference point. But here in relation to the, uh, the implant, you don't have a cemento enamel junction. So what you have to do is, you have to keep a reference point, either somewhere in re relation to the uh, prosthesis or in relation to the apartment. And keeping that reference point as a marking, you should take a measurement of the initial probing depth. And then when you recall the patient over a period of time, you, you use the first measurement as your reference to know whether the pocket depth is decreasing or increasing. So that is how you should probe around an implant. Bleeding on point. Whenever there is bleeding, it is a definite indicator that there is some sort of disease process happening over there. And it is a clear cut sign of periplanitis. In fact, one study says that presence of bleeding and probing is a better predictor for periimplant disease than analogous for periodontal disease. So it is a better predictor compared to periodontal disease. <coughs> Suppuration. It, whenever there is pus coming out along from the periimplant pocket, it means that there is an underlying infection there. It is a clear cut sign that there is periimplantitis there. There is an active lesion there. Now in percussion, when you per you can <coughs> percuss epically as well as laterally. <coughs> when you percuss, when more and more threads of the implants get exposed of alveolar bone, now the sound which there may be a dull sound of on percussion. But as far as now, the there is no conclusive scientific data to take percussion as a diagnostic criteria. Mobility. Now, if your mob implant is mobile, that means it's a failed implant. So you can remove that implant and then you can place a new implant, okay? But one thing when you look is, even you take a radiograph and find that almost about one or two threads of the implant rest up all the threads the, there is bone loss but in spite of that the implant may not be mobile and it may be in full function so once an implant that is mobile means it is lost and uh, to check the stability of an implant whether how well it is ocean integrated you have a device which is known as an oscillus device which basically works on resonance frequency analysis which actually records micro motion on the implant surface. And uh, you have reading by known as implant stability quotient. And if you have an ISQ value of approximately 70, that means you have a well, very good integrated implant, right? But uh, this resonance RFA or Ossel's device is not used to detect peri-implantitis. Another way by which you can diagnose periimplantitis is radiograph. Now radiographs should be taken immediately after restoration and then you can take a radiograph after one year. Now in one year, 0.2 mm of bone loss around an implant is acceptable. And from then about 0.1 millimeter of bone loss is also acceptable. But it is very difficult to differentiate this 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 mm of bone loss that is occurring in relation to an implant. So you need to, one thing is you need to take implants in the same orientation. Then only you can, radiographs in the same orientation. Then only you can compare these radiographs and come to know that there is change in our bone loss or bone gain. So one good method is a digital subtraction radiography, but that is not used in the day-to-day -day clinical practice, but this is used in research only. And the type of bone loss that you found, you find around an implant is that you find a horizontal or a saucer-shaped type of bone loss. Now, this is the type of bone loss that you usually found, commonly find around an implant. Now, this is how you diagnose uh, peri-implant disease. Now, the most important part is you should know what are the risk factors associated in the development of peri-implantitis. And one of the most important risk factors is poor oral hygiene. And when you look at whenever the plaque scores are high, 
when the patient has got poor oral health, there is always prevalence of perineal blanditis. In fact, there is a study by Hitz Merrifield, 2004, which clearly points out that if the patient has got poor oral hygiene, he is at 14 times at greater odds of developing perineal blanditis. So that, that is how important the maintenance of oral hygiene is. Now, the next risk factor is a previous history of perinatal disease or whether he currently has perinatal disease or whether he has any tooth loss associated with perinatal disease. Now, if you have data shows that if, you, if a patient has got a previous history of perinatal the patient is four times more likely to develop perinatal And there is another study which shows that if there is at least one residual pocket of more than six millimeter anywhere in the oral cavity, there is a risk of perimplantitis. So the important point here is you have to treat and manage all periodontal disease before you place an implant. And then you should give, ask the patient to maintain good oral hygiene. So these two things has to be controlled before you should venture into placing implants. Third risk factor, as with periodontitis, smoking is an important risk factor and smokers are five times more chance, have five times more chance of developing periodontitis than non-smokers. Any systemic factors which has an effect on the bone physiology or which impairs immune function has got a significant role in, has a significant role or it is a potent factor for the development of perimplantitis. All these diseases, which alters the bone physiology, <coughs> diabetes, osteoporosis, all these are risk factors for development of perimplantitis. <coughs> Excuse me. There is no clear cut data that genetics has got a role <coughs> in developing perimplantitis. Now we know that uh, there is there is a role of genes in uh, the transmission of periodontal disease, but as such, we don't have only very limited data. But occlusal overload is a predisposing factor for the development of periimplantitis. Many a times you place uh, the implant wherever there is bone, and finally, when you uh, try to load this implant with the processes, sometimes you have to give a, a, a long <coughs> crowns or sometimes you have to give an angulated crown. So there is always, the, the load is not passing axially. And at the interfaces where there is maximum overload, there tends to be bone loss. And uh, this hypersensitivity, foreign body reaction and <coughs> physical chemical aspects, have got, they're, they're not well documented. There are a lot of studies has to be done so that they have to be proven to the, uh, proven in such a way that they may act as really potent agents in development of periodontitis, periimplantitis. So these are the risk factors. Now, some of the risk factors associated with the implant site are, one is keratinized tissue. Now, as with periodontitis, development of periodontitis, we always say that you, know, you need sufficient, a good amount of uh, keratinized tissue around the tooth as well as implant for maintaining good periodontal or peri-implant health. If you have more than, data shows that if there are more than two millimeters, that is very fine. And whenever there is less than two mm of keratinized tissue, there are these increased chance of developing peri-implant diseases. Now, these are cases which can, you can see that uh, here you have uh, almost, there is no attached gingiva over here. The implant threads are exposed over here. Another case you can see, <coughs> This from the uh, journal, you can see a lot of plaque accumulation. You can see that absolutely there's no attached gingiva over here. And uh, what they've done, they, uh, they've done a subepithelial connective tissue graft. And uh, finally, when it is healed, you look at the, you can compare the health around these implant tissues just by increasing the zone of attached gingiva. So that is the relevance or uh, relevance of attached gingiva <coughs> in retarding uh, the spread of inflammation around the tooth as well as an implant. Another thing that affects uh, 
is bone quality. Now, in most of the time, when you want to place an implant, you may find that in those patients who are willing, there will be less bone. So, in most of the time, you have to do a lot of grafting by means of different types of autograft, allograft, xenograft, whatever type of graft. And, more, and over a period of time, when we look at that, there is a lot of resorption of these bone grafts. And uh, we find that, you know, we place implant in a grafted bone and uh, there is more chance of developing peri-implant disease when you place implant in relation to a uh, grafted area. So that is the relevance of this peri <laughs> the quality of bone with uh, in regard to the development of peri-implantitis. And uh, next important factor is implant positioning and restoration. Okay, now, <clears throat> The previous dictum, as I told you before, was a bone-derived implantology where you place an implant wherever there is sufficient bone. But now that is not the case. Now the case is the implantology is a prosthetically and a periodontally driven science. So you have to think now or you have to decide where your final prosthesis is coming. And depending upon where your prosthesis is coming, you have to place an implant in a particular good angulation. And if there is no bone, you have to do all different techniques of regenerative uh, surgeries so that you bring or develop bone in such area, grow bone in that area, and then you place an implant there. And when you look at um, uh, implant placement, implant place it should be in ideal position. The head of the implant should be around uh, two to three to four millimeter from the neck of the adjacent tooth. There should be a distance of 1.5 between the tooth and the implant. And if you're placing two implants, that should be a minimum of three millimeter gap. If that is all, all not taken care of, always there is a chance of developing any implant like this. Now here, this is an ideal condition. Now the head of the implant should be around, now this is the neck of the adjacent teeth. It should be around three to four millimeter. And if it is more deeper, as deeper it goes, what happens is you have a long peri-implant pocket over here. Okay, which the patient is, it's typical for the patient to clean. And always they should, from the implant to the adjacent tooth, you should maintain a distance of 1.5 mm. And between these uh, two implants, you should maintain three mm. Only then you should, we'll have a papilla like this developing for aesthetics. And, uh, this is an ideal position of an implant. You can see there is sufficient amount of about two millimeter of bone in the labial aspect, and uh, it is all uh, in the center. So it's nicely placed. Now, <clears throat> look at this implant over here. Now, this, this is the CEJ, you can see. Now, how far down they place the implant? And now they've given a long crown over here. What has happened is, you know, the patient can't maintain this area well, and it has resulted in peri implantitis. Another case here, the implant is placed a little bit more parallelly. This is the restriction that is to be given here. And look here, there's a screw retained restriction where you are going to place this, the label aspect of this. This label aspect will respond to this, this uh, area like this here, so that it will be aesthetically pleasing. But look at the cantilever here. At the same time, you look at the area over here. This area is going to coincide in this area. Now, how is the patient going to maintain this? This, this whole area, this bulky crown over here. So this all is going to give, lead to peri-implantitis. So if you don't plan your uh, prosthesis or plan your implant placement, that in the finally you may be able to place an implant, but definitely maintenance of that implant is difficult and probably because of inflammation, you may have failures in relation to that implant. Now, the, the space is not maintained between these two implants. Look what has happened. A lot of bone loss has occurred. Now, there are certain hydrogenic factors, you know, like uh, excess cement. Now, sometimes uh, in apartments are not sitting, the screw is loose. The overcondo that we have already discussed, malpositioning and technical complications we have already discussed. Now, look what has happened. There is cement in relation. There's a cement retained crown. Your cement is retained, and that has resulted in this massive bone loss over here. Look at the under condition. <coughs> the the there's not joint. There's a gap between here. A lot of plaque that is going to accumulate. The patient is not going to 
maintain this area well and it has resulted in that bow loss. And suppose the screw, if the screw retain restoration, the screw becomes loose again, the <coughs> implant and the abutment junction, there is going to be a gap uh, which accumulates a lot of plaque and this may cause so much amount of bone destruction. <coughs> Another thing is we always use, reuse <coughs> a lot of uh, healing abutments. And uh, this is the photo, this is this photograph in one study, what they have uh, cleaned this uh, healing abutment apartments well and their autoclave is also and after that a disclosing agent was applied and look at the amount of plaque you find over these now suppose you are introducing this during a second stage surgery to an implant area you are introducing a lot of bacteria into that area and from there even before you place the process itself the pre-implantitis is going to stop it. So those were the risk factors associated with peri-implantitis. Now, one thing that I would like to all of you to know is you should know a terminology which is known as retrograde peri-implantitis. Now, uh, it is almost akin to uh, retrograde periodontitis, but there's a slight difference here. Now, here you have a well osho degraded implant. The, the peri-implant margin or the gingival tissues are very well absolutely healthy, but you may find there is a swelling or a fistless tract in relation to the most apical part of the implant. And later on, when you take a radiograph, you find you may find a radiolescency like this. That is known as retrograde periimplantitis. And uh, the common reasons <coughs> for retrograde peri periimplantitis is not due to the in common inflama inflammation that is associated with uh, the routine periimplantitis. It may be due to the surgical trauma, the overheating of the bone, the compression of the bone during surgery, or sometimes, you know, you carry, when you are placing the implant, some of the bacteria may be carried deep into the lesion, that deep into that osteotomy site. Premature loading can lead to my bone microfractures. That may cause this peri, uh, retrograde periimplantitis, or sometimes there may be pre-existing inflammation there that flares up. So these are some of the etiology for retrograde periimplantitis. So this is also something that you should know. <clears throat> now we have discussed about uh, how to diagnose a case of periimplantitis. What are the etiology behind it? What are the risk factors associated with it? Now you place an implant in a patient. You should always advise the patient for proper, proper maintenance. Now after doing your scaling, you advise good oral hygiene measures to the patient. After surgery, you advise a lot of, give a lot of instructions, recall the patient. So all similarly, after implant placement also, you should give proper instructions and you should have a maintenance protocol. That's, that's what we are going to discuss now. Now, <clears throat> now after implantology, they can, even if you place one or multiple implants, you advise the patient to maintain Good or regular good oral hygiene with brushing, but there may be some little more care that may be extended to implants. Now, suppose you are giving one implant, the recommended technique is you ask the patient to floss, and there is a flossing technique that is recommended, which is known as a crossover flossing technique, which I'll show you. Okay. But in most of the cases, now you, you give multiple implants, or sometimes there may be a full mouth rehabilitation. Sometimes in the lower area, you may give four implants or six implants or eight implants, similarly for the upper area. So the patient and after, then you place a bulky processes over this implant. The patient won't know where the implants are there. So one thing is you should educate the patient, the location of the implants, and then you should advise the patient to clean that area. The agents there can be used other than uh, these uh, antimicrobial agents are for mechanical cleansing, you can use single tufted brushes, bristle brushes, proxa brushes, all these brushes can be used. Now this is the, <clears throat> what I told, the crossover flossing technique that should be given for a single implant. And along with that, uh, you can ask that your irrigation can be given, water pick or other aids can be used. <clears throat> now this is the interproximal brush that may be curved to go into the interproximal space between implants. Now this is a contra-angled, uh, unit tufted brush 
Now you can see these are these points corresponds to the screw holes where the we have uh, screwed the implant. So you, these are all. So you have an implant here. 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 You can look into that. You, you will be knowing. But you have to educate the patient by showing in this mirror that these are the locations where the implants are, and you should advise the patient to maintain uh, around the implant as well as clean under the this prosthesis also. Then only. Uh, you can prevent the <coughs> prevent peri-implantitis or peri-implant disease from occurring. Now, similar to your uh, supportive penal therapy, you have <coughs> a maintenance protocol that is developed by Alani and Bishop uh, in 2014. So here, if you give a single crown or a, a bridge uh, with two abutments, the recall interval is one year. But suppose the patient has got some risk factors, you recall him in six months. But apart from that, if you give a, a long bridge or a full arch bridge or a complete uh, full mouth rehabilitation with dentures, recall interval is usually six months. And if again in those patients, if you have the patient has got any risk factors, which we discussed before, you recall the patient around three to four months. Okay. And as I told you before, you have to take a radiograph one year after. Uh, prosthesis and look at there will be definitely some amount of uh, radiographic changes because of uh, the bone settling in but you don't have to routinely uh, take radiograph when the patients come every other every six months or one year now if there is signs of peri-implantitis clinical signs of peri-implantitis then you indicate radiograph in such patients now uh, they these same people alanium uh, Bishop have, uh, they have put forward a 10 point inspection plan that you should do whenever you recall the patient for your supportive, supportive peri-implant therapy. So these are the things I'm not going to dis detail, discuss about all these things. These are things that you similarly do for your periodontitis cases, but only thing is the slight difference is there because you have placed an implant. That's all. <clears throat> now, we have uh, placed an implant. We have advised the patient to good or maintain good oral hygiene. In spite of that, we know that there is an incidence and prevalence of around 50 to 80 percentage of pet implant lesions. How are we going to manage them? Now, <clears throat> these are the different tenets or protocol or basis on which you are going to manage pet implant diseases. One is Similar to your periodontitis or gingivitis, you have biofilm or plaque and calculus attached to the implant surface. So the first idea will be removing this biofilm from this area, peri-implant sulcus. That is the first one. Second one, now once you have done a scaling and root planing for a natural tooth, the next thing is you are doing a root planing. Why are you doing a root planing? You are doing a root planing because in relation to a periodontal pocket, the outermost layer of cementum is infected or an affected, affected cementum. Okay, we have a diseased cementum. Similar to that, the outer surface of the implant is also diseased now. So you now have to decontaminate the implant surface. So that is your second principle based on which your management is going to take place. The third one is if you have in the sites which has got some deficiencies or some certain peculiarity at this site, attach gingiva is not that. You may probably have to augment the attach gingiva. Now, if in certain sites <coughs> the bone defect is uh, in such a way that you can regenerate, that is not conducive for maintenance, then probably you'll have to resect that area. So similar to peroneal surgery, what you do in a normal uh, routine peroneal surgery, you do a regenerative or a resective type of surgery, depending on And then you advise the patient to maintain an effective block control regimen. So this is the blueprint for the management of peri-implant disease. So you can classify the management as into two aspects. One is non-surgical management, and the second is the surgical treatment, which as we discussed earlier, will be the resective, that is a non-regenerative therapy, and then next is the regenerative therapy. 
Now, what is the non-surgical treatment? Non-surgical as good oral hygiene instructions. You advise the patient. We discussed about how to uh, how to advise patient in maintaining good oral hygiene. So that is the first one. Second is you have to mechanically remove the biofilm. But here uh, there are certain changes here that we'll discuss one by one. Third one is you can use antiseptics to control the microbes in that area. In some cases, you have to supplement with antibiotics. That's similar to how you manage your periodontal disease. And also you can use lasers to decontaminate that area. So instrumentation around implants. Now you, you can use your routine uh, steel scalers to instrument on the root surface. But if you use the same scalers and instrument the implant surface, because the steel is much harder than titanium, it may cause scratches. It may roughen the surface. So always you have to use a instrument which is softer. So it may be a titanium or a material that is softer than titanium. So you can use a plastic or a graphite or a carbon, uh, which are reinforced with fibers. So these are the common things that are used. Then ultrasonics can be used, but ultrasonic tips cannot be a steel tip because again, it can uh, abrade the or roughen the implant surface. You can use a plastic ultrasonic tip or onto your regular ultrasonic tip, you can add certain sleeves, okay? Apart from these, you can use air abrasive units uh, for uh, decontaminating the roots of, I mean, the implant surface. And also the implant surface can be cleaned by means of a rubber cup by using different abrasive paste like tin or tin oxide, right? So these are the different methods. <clears throat> now, this is these are the different instruments that you commonly use, you know, these are carbon or graphite tips. This is what I told. You have a regular uh, <coughs> ultrasonic scalar tip onto which you place a sleeve. And uh, these are titanium brushes that actually, you can actually clean the implant surface by means of these brushes. You can attach this to a micro motor and at a low speed, you can clean the implant surface. Again, these are uh, graphite instruments. So all these, these are plastic instruments, but uh, to my experience, uh, you can use plastic instrument, but the thing is it's totally ineffective. So you, you actually should, uh, this is an ideal way and uh, this combined with this along with the lasers will be a good way of uh, uh, contaminate, decontaminating the implant surface. Apart from all this mechanical cleansing, you can uh, give antimicrobials also so that you can reduce the microbial load there. So one way by which the implant surface can be cleaned is by means of uh, applying chlorhexidine gel, stannous fluoride, different tetracycline, citric acid. Um, <clears throat> even with saline, you can clean. So basically, it is like akin to your root biomodification. Okay, after you've done a mechanical cleansing, you can uh, decontaminate the root surface. Uh, I mean, the implant surface by means of any of these antimicrobials. And in some cases, <laughs> you may have to supplement in cases of um, a, a defect. You have a, a defect, a real bone defect there. In, in most of these cases, you have to supplement a, a antibiotic and usually you supplement with metronidazole or a combination of <clears throat> amoxicillin and metronidazole. Or you can try local drug delivery also. You have different local drug delivery systems. Uh, I'm not going to detail. Uh, you know about all these systems. Any of these systems can be used in the in supplementing antibiotics into the peri implant sulcus area. <clears throat> and lasers. There are you find a lot of studies in the literature about lasers. Now lasers can be used in different way. One is a laser can be used to do a scaling or the root surface to remove the deposits. Second laser can be used to reduce the microbial load over there. It can be used to, to remove the sulcus lining and degranulation of tissues. It can be used as a biostimulation at lower level or along with certain dyes, you can do a photodynamic therapy. Now what happens in photodynamic therapy is <clears throat> you inject a little bit of dye into that uh, peri-implant sulcus uh, the bacteria takes up this dye and once the bacteria has taken up this dye you apply laser to that area and this will, laser will stimulate these dyes and <coughs> causes a release of free radicals 
which actually kills the bacteria. So that is uh, photodynamic therapy. I mean, look at lasers. Uh, in the literature, we, you may find different types of lasers, but the one laser that stands out in the management of peri implant disease is the fpm yak laser. All other lasers are used, and it is said that uh, you should use nd laser with caution. But the one laser which is, uh, has got maximum uh, scientific evidence uh, in the literature is the fpm yak laser in the management of peri implantitis. <coughs> And uh, there is a protocol that has been developed, uh, which is known as LAPIP protocol. It is almost a modification of LANAP. LANAP is nothing but uh, <coughs> uh, attachment by means of uh, uh, laser enhanced new attachment procedure, laser assisted new attachment procedure. That is LAPIP is la laser assisted peri implantitis protocol. Now, <clears throat> this is a protocol that is developed by a company known as Millennium Technologies in the US. It's a patented technology. Now, what they use is uh, this laser machine. There's a Perio Lace MVP7, it's a NDAC laser. And the inventor is the Robert H. Craig II. And what they do is in the initial stages, uh, this is the peri implant uh, sulcus. Uh, they, they just uh, apply a laser so that it introduce the microbial load over there. Then you do a scaling and remove the whatever debris that is present on the implant surface. A slight bone recontouring is there done. And later on, the area is filled with blood clot. And uh, what they do is they apply laser and <coughs> this, this clot is being sealed. And uh, so you have a, something, some sort of a closed environment and you have a lot of uh, uh, growth factors and other cells uh, coming on from this osteoblast and other differentiating cell and differentiating mesenchymal cells coming into this area and helping in regenerating the bone. At the same time, a little bit of occlusion is also adjusted. So this is the protocol that has been put forward. This is a, this is a patented technology, is a USFD approved technology. That is LAPID, laser assisted peri implant protocol. Now we look into the Surgical aspect, surgical therapy. One is the we have non-regenerative therapy that is similar to that of uh, the resective therapy that we do. So we, what you do is it's all similar to your resective osseous surgery. Uh, what we do here now, this is a case <coughs> you, you have a lot of bone loss associated with this implant. So you can see the incision is put. And you can look, uh, when you look at over here, what you can find is, you know, the implant threads are exposed. Uh, the, the bone is not, the bone shape is not conducive for bone regeneration. So what they've done is they've uh, reshaped the bone around the implant. And also whatever implant that has been exposed to the oral cavity, the outer surface of the implant has been the smoothened. And that procedure is known as implantoplasty. Basically, uh, most of these implant surface will be rough and it will be treated. Sometimes it may be acid etched uh, SLA or <clears throat> maybe hydroxy uptake coated. Or they've got different coatings and it is usually rough. So it will attract a lot of plaque. So these implant threads are, uh, are smoothened by means of, you can do implantoplasty by using uh, uh, diamond burrs. The same time after that you can polish by different types of stones so that it attracts the least amount of plaque and after that you can give a you can place the uh, you can do an epically displaced flap or an undisplaced flap depending upon uh, what the situation is <coughs> and you can see the initial healing you can see that uh, the internal space is opened up but the patient can even this implant even those threads are exposed there's least amount of plaque accumulation there here yeah, the patient can maintain well, is well healed. So this is a resective type of osseous surgery where you probably do implant surgery, uh, implantoplasty and do an epically displaced one. The other one is a surgical regenerative therapy. Now this is similar to your regenerative therapy for periodontitis. You use different types of bone graft. You can use different types of <coughs> differentiating both differentiating factors and membranes. You combine depending upon the defect, you use different types of all these things. Now, this is a case report that shows that there is a peri implant that is you can see, and you can see, look at the gingiva that is really enlarged. 
in relation to that. And uh, what they've done is they've given an internal pivotal incision in such a way that all the granulation tissue will remain attached to this implant surface. So, and then they've reflected this flap. So this, you can see all the granulation tissue here. And uh, once the granulation tissue is slightly removed, what you can see is you can look at what, this is what has caused the disease over here. You can see a lot of cement over here. So this uh, <coughs> cement is the one reason why a lot of bone loss has occurred. And uh, they have cleaned that and they've applied antimicrobials there. They've planned it with laser. And uh, <coughs> this is how it looks like. Now they plan to do a regenerative type of surgery. So a little bit of decortication of the remaining bone was done. So that bleeding points were induced and then bone grafting was done on that side. A membrane was placed. And uh, this is how it healed. And you can see how well, <coughs> when you compare the bone, uh, the density of the bone has also increased. And you can see the bone fill has also taken increase. And clinically, you see that it looks absolutely healthy. So this is <coughs> regenerative type of peri implant surgery. <coughs> and finally, one thing you should know uh, when you know discuss about the management of peri implantitis is something called as cumulative interceptive supportive therapy. It is CYST and it was proposed by Mamali and Lang in 1998. So this gives a good idea of what, how to go about uh, in managing perimplantitis depending upon the different conditions. Now, if you have a probing depth of only, so this is absolutely healthy. If uh, the plaque index and there is no bleeding, is less than one and uh, bleeding, um, there's no bleeding and probing then you just have to maintain mechanical deprivement, regular polishing, scaling, that is all that is needed. And that treatment is known as A. Now, if you have uh, slight bleeding and probing also, that's the same thing, okay? Then if you have a pocket depth of about four to five millimeter, you know, this was a old protocol, but you know, this has to be modified slightly as per the new uh, criteria on which you, uh, the base you're probing that. <coughs> In case you have a deeper sulcus, if you find that the, your pocket depth is deepening, then along with this, you can give an antiseptic cleaning. And the recommended uh, chlorexidin gel twice daily for about three to four weeks. And this is protocol A. So in case of pocket depth, increasing pocket depth, so regular treatment, that is A. So A plus B, you can combine. Now. If you have, if you find that the pocket depth is increasing, then probably along with bleeding and probing, then you will have to take a radiograph. So when you take a radiograph and you find that it's the initial stage of a peri implant, that is, there is no cratering. Again, you need, there's no other type of intervention that is needed. You just need A and B. That is all that is needed. But if you see a notable cratering of around two millimeter, in that case, you have to, along with A and B, you have to add systemic or local antibiotics also. But if you have a real cratering of cranial than bone loss of more than two millimeter, you have to add, that is where you go for you. The A plus B plus C, all these are non-surgical treatment, but then you go for D. That is a surgical treatment, which may be a regenerative or a resective type of treatment. <coughs> So that is a, the take home message that I have for you is uh, peri implantitis is, is not different from peritonitis. It shares the same microbiology, same etiopathogen. It is almost similar. Proper treatment planning and execution is a major factor. You have to plan the end in the beginning and then you have to start from there so that you don't make mistakes. You can give a beautiful restoration which is the aesthetically placing, it is functional and the patient can maintain well. Maintenance and supportive care is the most critical thing. Akin to periodontitis, after you manage the periodontitis or gingivitis lesion, you put them on supportive therapy. It's similar to that, you have to give a maintenance protocol for all your implant patients. And <clears throat> peri-implantitis can be treated similar to periodontal disease, which we discussed earlier. And whenever there is osseous defect, always you have to do a surgical therapy. If you have a definite crater-like defect is there, do a 
regenerative or a resecty type of osseous surgery. But whatever said and done, there is absolutely no definite protocol that has been developed so far that you say that you do this for this condition, for this condition. So depending upon your clinical experience and whatever guidelines that are present, presented before you, the evidence that are present have, that you have before you, you have to take a call. This is <clears throat> where I've been working for the past almost 20 years and um, still working very happy over here. And uh, I thank, uh, once again, thank uh, all the organizers for giving me an opportunity for presenting and thank each one of you for patiently listening to this. Thank you. <laughs>